thank you very much for your warm welcome and for the introduction. Um, dear experts at IU team, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm Michael Tiede. I'm a Berlin-based international economist. I've held the position of a professor of healthcare management at the IU for a um, little over five years now. For the last 30 years, I've also worked as a policy consultant in the areas of health policy, health economics and financing, and global health. I've worked in over 20 health systems, 20 uh, countries across all continents um, except Antarctica. So today's topic is on the intelligent use of um, evidence for health systems design. And um, it's a topic that's very close to my heart. I'm, I'm very passionate about this, and I hope that I can share some of this passion with you. Um, in order to clarify the uh, topic, some aspects of the topic, I'm going to occasionally refer to the country case of the East African country of Rwanda. Um, Rwanda, um, most of you will be familiar with um, the aspects of its traumatic history, but Rwanda is a country that has um, an impressive um, economic growth over recent decades. And more importantly, in our context, um, it has shown an impressive development of a health system within um, only a couple of uh, decades. So we'll occasionally try to understand what Rwanda may have done right. But let's firstly take apart the title of today's talk. So on the intelligent um, use of evidence in health systems design. Intelligence is all about the ability to learn, the ability to understand um, and to think in a logical way uh, about things and to do this well. We would like to see this as a forte of our health policy makers and will refer to uh, some of these uh, um, aspects of the intelligent use. So um, actually, this whole event series um, is all about intelligence, and I'll try to uh, contribute from my own discipline. Intelligence has many dimensions. The use of evidence in health systems um, has a lot to do with social intelligence. So now we're also talking about the intelligent use of evidence. What is evidence? Evidence is basically anything that helps us to prove that something is or is not true. So it's about what works, what doesn't work, and why. The police may look for fingerprints as evidence. Um, in applied research, evidence is commonly associated with uh, data analysis. In health systems, um, these data comprise data sets such as epidemiological data, data on health services utilization, um, data from clinical studies, real-world patient data, some of these data may be available on a routine basis. For example, in the form of health insurance claims data that we can then use, analyze, and try to interpret. I think we all got a little bit more familiar with the relevance of data in health um, in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> this has made clear the relevance of high-quality, comprehensive um, data. 
we all know now um, about uh, case numbers, incidence and prevalence of a disease. We understand data on the vaccination effectiveness. We may even be familiar with the famous um, R0 uh, value. You may remember the basic reproduction value of the, of the virus. And we can distinguish concepts such as fatality and mortality. So, but let's get back to the, to the health system. A health system is like any system, an ordered set of um, interconnected elements conveying a structure or structures. It's designed by humans and is therefore an artificial system as compared to a natural system. Um, we may also consider it as a socio-mechanical system, meaning that it has a social component and a technical component, such as the technical infrastructure underlying many processes in the health systems, like the IT infrastructure. Most of all, it's a dynamic system. So we, the system we see, for example, in this country today is certainly not the same um, as it was 10 years ago, and is definitely not the same ago as it was um, when it was implemented in Bismarckian times towards the end of the 19th century. Oh, I promised to occasionally say a few words on Rwanda. So Rwanda is an East African country of about 13 million. It spends about 7.3% of its GDP um, on health. That is uh, significantly more than other low-income countries. I've just returned from a trip to Ethiopia. Ethiopia, for example, spends about 3.5% of its GDP um, on health. So that translates um, in Rwanda to approximately $51 a year per person um, as health expenditure. That is also more than the average low-income country, which averages about $39 US dollars. According to the Global Innovation Index, Rwanda is one of the most innovative countries on the African continent. So, um, but what is important for us is that nearly 100% of the population are covered by health insurance. That is um, quite an achievement. Now, hold on. Um, why am I telling you all of this? What is this all about? Ultimately, a properly functioning health system serves to protect one of our most fundamental goods, health. Good health is the prerequisite. Um, it enables us as humans to participate in any form of social or cultural life. Good health also allows us uh, to be productive, uh, make productive contributions to the economy. So ultimately, good health contributes to our common good. This um, ties into some of the fundamental ideas on, and concepts underlying the uh, so-called Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Um, many of you may have heard about the SDGs. These uh, constitute a set of goals that um, were developed in the context of the United Nations and, and um, agreed upon by all member states of the UN in 2015. There are goals like quality education, gender equality, um, access to clean water, and among this set of goals, you also find goal number three, that is 
ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. So these goals are pursued and, and, and um, ideally um, achieved to the, to, the, to the best possible degree by the year 2030. Now, um, each of those goals has a, whole, a large set of, of targets and target 3.8 of goal 3, the health goal, is universal health coverage. And this target is what Rwanda has worked towards, covering everyone, ensuring access according to need, and financing according to ability to pay. Rwanda has been called by the World Health Organization the beacon of universal health coverage in Africa. How could Rwanda achieve this? Well, um, Rwanda has developed a well-structured network of services, of service provision um, across all geographical areas. Rwanda is a small country. Still, there are some areas that you could consider rural and remote. And it has um, ensured that good data are available. So the uh, Ministry of Health actually runs an integrated health management information system. And these data um, serve as the foundation for policy and planning in the country. Let me be clear. I have um, used the Rwandan example because the country has done some smart things and got some things right, such as the institutionalization of data management and evidence-based um, uh, planning. However, there are still a few things missing that would provide the institutional structure in a more responsive format. Um, namely, participation, transparency, accountability. These basic features of good governance are ultimately critical to the suc successful institutionalization of evidence-based um, decision-making. Over recent years, I've had the pleasure and the opportunity to involve IU students in the generation of evidence. There are many fine examples. I particularly um, remember um, one um, where an IU student got involved, that was a couple of years ago, um, got involved in a WHO-initiated uh, project focusing on enablers and barriers to a membership renewal system in the Ghanaian health insurance based on mobile technology. This was a fine example of qualitative research, and that's why I'm mentioning it. So... Um, relevant data for, for planning and for making evidence-based decisions do not necessarily need to be based on quantitative analysis, but there is also, of course, um, very important qualitative research using qualitative data to create um, relevant evidence. A second example, um, two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to catch up with an Ethiopian IU student um, whom I could meet in Addis Ababa where she is generating some evidence um, around the effectiveness of community-based health insurance with regard to access to medicines. Another really exciting uh, project uh, that demonstrates how evidence may 
ultimately feed into decision making in health systems. But beyond the generation of such small scale evidence, we need strong institutions that are able to absorb evidence on a continuous basis. Examples of such institutions exist in high-income countries. Um, this is, for example, the case where um, health technology assessment, HTA, is institutionalized in the form of agencies such as the ICWIC in Germany, NICE in the UK, or the um, Haute Autorité de la Santé in France, and there are many other um, examples where information on the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of interventions and programs is um, generated, analyzed, uh, made available um, for decision making in healthcare. For example, with a view to the design of benefit packages for health insurance. However, apart from the evidence on effectiveness and cost effectiveness, we need to understand other aspects as well, such as the equity implications of um, programs and interventions, the fairness in terms of um, answering the question as to who benefits from these interventions given their degree of vulnerability or their socioeconomic background. Also, we need data to answer um, the questions around sustainability. Yeah, and when designing institutions, we also need to adjust the institutional fit um, through our understanding of how these institutions may resonate with the people they're ultimately supposed to serve. It's a long way towards evidence-based policy making. Um, I've just been discussing an approach to establish a platform for evidence generation and absorption between research institutions and policy makers um, in Pakistan as an important step towards evidence-based policy making. Turns out it's, it's also um, in the first stages about finding a common language. Researchers need to be able to present their research in ways that can be understood by policymakers. They need to be very clear that they answer the policymakers' exact questions. However, policymakers also need to be able to express their needs and, ex um, and, and requirements in terms that can be understood by researchers and can be addressed appropriately. Let me raise a caveat, though. There are many reasons why not all policy making towards better health systems can be based on evidence. There's actually a long list. Let me just mention three. Firstly, um, the generation of evidence may take a long time. Secondly, not all evidence that is generated is unambiguous or conclusive. There may not be clear um, instructions that can be derived from this evidence. Um, and last but not least, uh, political processes may demand certain moves in terms of policy making that don't have anything to do with evidence. So, <clears throat> ah, I, I have yet another <laughs> little anecdote that is not so much about um, evidence itself, but it's about good governance. 
Remember, I made this point about good governance before. Um, I'd ha have a few of these stories handy, but let me just mention uh, one. Involved in health reform in country X, I'm not going to, uh, going to name the country, I was invited to join a committee supposed to provide um, advice on policy reform based on evidence and based on the insights from the perspective of all possible stakeholders. Well, all possible stakeholders were uh, represented on the committee, um, some private sector stakeholders, however, got the invites to committee meetings and events late, always late and occasionally not at all. Humankind is at a point where we face many challenges associated with potential shocks that we cannot predict at this point. We are all aware of the upheaval of global economic systems and societies that cause uh, ruptures within health systems as well. There is the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is still ongoing and impacts on daily life in many parts of this world. Social cohesion is declining at a grand scale. We're facing climate change, new wars, issues around food security and um, various other security crises. So health system resilience and responsiveness to shocks have much to do with the timely absorption of evidence. To achieve this, a thorough understanding of data and the ability to use such information comprehensively, intelligently and effectively are essential. They form essential prerequisites. Now, um, this does not just refer to national level data, but tying national health systems into certain global health data networks that are currently em emerging, that are slowly evolving. That is similarly essential to ensure, for example, that health systems are responsive to global threats. All of this indicates that digitalization, a strength here at IU within um, the scope of study programs offered, digitalization lies at the heart of our health system goals. Across countries, different levels of um, economic power, we still have a long way to go. What we are often seeing is a poor excuse in light of the digital ecosystems that we would like to see. And of course, engaging with health system data in a narrow sense cannot suffice in order to tackle tomorrow's health threats and in order to become better in addressing people's individual and collective healthcare needs, an intersectoral perspective will be required. Um, that means that our data ecosystem needs to extend into other areas of social life, such as understanding social protection, education, lifestyles, however, always keeping um, with data security and privacy uh, protection, obviously. To sum up, um, a structure of institutions that are able to collect, process and analyze evidence to inform health policy making lies at the very heart of any resilient health system 
that is able to adapt to the multitude of global economic and societal crises that we are facing today. And I need everyone who's listening to apply your expertise towards the strengthening of evidence-based systems. We need to gather evidence, but we need to use it intelligently to support the common good. Thank you.